The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. Okay, hi everyone, and welcome to my um, talk. I will today present to you some of the research I did during my PhD. Uh, my name is Noor Hamdan, and I'm currently um, wrapping up my PhD. Yay, finally. Um, I have been working with very different kind of electronics. So for the past five years, I've been intrigued by electronics that are really, really soft, really, really thin, and sometimes in liquid forms. So. Uh, do you have any imagination or idea on what type of electronics I'm talking about? Do you, did you hear of a liquid electronic, a liquid sensor, or a very, very thin actuator, a resistor that is completely bendable and stretchable? Yes? Uh, for the resistor, you can use threads as the resistor. Yep. For example, so it's textile. Yes. The yes, so that's one example. So you know basic wires, uh, every wire has a resistance. We usually expect it to be zero, and that's how we do our calculations when we are doing the circuit. But in reality, every wire does have some resistance. And in a similar way, you can use threads, cover them with silver, for example, dip them in silver, and silver is conductive, and then this, the wire, the, these threads, which are like the very flexible and small threads you're using for your clothes, become themselves wires. But because they have resistance, depending on how much silver you have on them, you can shape them in a way to change the resistance of um, the two endpoints. So you, may, you can increase or decrease the resistance accordingly. And this is just a simple example. My first work um, um, during my PhD was about manipulating conductive yarn or conductive thread, which is coated with um, silver or that has a core that is made of very, very, very thin um, uh, regular wires. Or um, now we have other technologies that nano use nano, nano um, engineering in order to embed um, conductive material into the thread's core. So all of these methods done by the material engineers and the textile, textile engineers delivered to us as HCI researchers. And then we go from there and think, what kind of interfaces can we do with these? And the first thing that occurred to me is that we can do interfaces that are soft, fluffy, large, because now we don't have to worry about too, too many electronics because or, or wiring and all these nets that you have to do if there is a large interface. And they are relatively cheaper than silicon-based electronics. So jumping from, from my work with textiles, I was looking for wh what if I can do something that actuates? And the difference, you, don't, you know the difference between sensing and actuating? Sensing is a sensor, like um, a, it could be a touch sensor, it could be a proximity sensor, it could be um, a sensor that um, detects light change, any kind of um, difference in stimulation, and changes some kind of um, effect in it. For example, it could change um, its conductance, and we can measure it in a way to figure out that there has been a touch on this sensor, for example. An actuator is something that moves, changes shape, changes size, or um, and makes mechanical work. So it kind of makes a force when it moves. And um, the material that I have been using in order to create these soft actuators is called shape mirror alloys. Today I will be presenting to you how I use shape mirror alloys in a very creative way in order to create um, tactile sensors or uh, tactile devices, sorry, or haptic devices that actuate on your skin. So my devices, I call them springlets because they are mainly made of a spring of shape memory alloy. So this image kind of um, represents my devices. This is a three structure flexible um, sticker. It is made of kinesia tape on the bottom. This is the medical tape that you use as um, in, in for sport activities. Um, a, a layer of um, silicone just for to give it structure a little bit. 
And then the spring inside is our my smart material, the shaping your alloy. So all these materials that I was talking about, the soft materials, are actually referred to as smart materials. And smart materials do not occur in nature um, on their own. They're actually engineered materials, either using, as, as I said, nanotechnology or some, of, or some kind of other fabrication technique to make them smart. So potentially, in the future, you can choose any material in the world and make it smarter, give it some power, say, I can take a piece of wood and say, I want that to be able to sense light. I would, I would like that to be able to move. I'd take, for example, something more flexible, like rubber. I would like that to, to be able to move. And what, what, they actu what the engineers will actually do is take materials that can do this movement, like the um, shape memory alloys, because of their um, mechanical and chemical um, structure, and embed them in these new basic structures so they would appear to us to be smart or to have powers. But now let's talk about the materials that are already engineered. This, this is a table that shows a bunch of smart materials. And every smart material has a stimuli, so something that activates it, and have a, has a response or a reaction. And what I've worked with is shape memory alloys in particular. Their stimuli was heat or temperature, and their response was change in, sh in, to, in between two, two, two shapes. So you train the shape memory alloy on one shape, let's say, uh, to be a wire, and you train it on another shape, like a coil. And when you heat it up, it converts from one shape to another. That's the basic idea of it. When it converts from one shape to another, it does that quickly, and it does that with force. So there's energy stored in shapes. And this is where they, became, they become useful for us as actuators, because if I have force, I can make things move, right? So other than shape mirror alloys, there are resistive inks, similar idea to um, conductive yarns. These are just the inks that we know with particles of um, silver or other kind of material that can conduct and have resistivity. There are a lot of fluids um, that can also me do mechanical responses. Um, what else do we have interesting here? Thermochromic inks are inks that if you stimulate them, they change color. And usually they change from one color to another and that is uh, um, uh, from con one color to a transparent color. Um, there are materials that are activated by the magnetic field, materials that are activated by electricity. And for example, here that electro, the piezoelectric materials are very, very, very big um, family of materials that are activated mechanically. Um, if you ever worked with um, smart textiles, piezoelectric textiles or even piezoelectric sensors in, in general, if you pressure on them, they can give you a different reading on the multimeter. So they can detect pressure. And that means that they actually respond to a mechanical stimulus and give us a change in electrical response. So we can use any kind of piezoelectric material to figure pressure using an electrical monitor. This is how you think of this table and this is how you decide what kind of material you want um, based on that stimuli that you will provide it, what do you want to feel, do you want to, or do you want to sense, and what do you want to achieve? Okay, so let's jump into springlets. So our motivation was that our skin is super intelligent. It is made of a number of, sensor, of skin receptors called mechanoreceptors, and these can detect vibration, they can detect pressure, they can detect motion, and they can also detect deformation. Hmm, where did it go? Okay, yes. So touch is something that um, um, uh, some, some of our mechanical receptors are um, responsible for. Stretch or deformation um, is, is the responsibility of other receptors, so is pressure and motion. And knowing this, this information, we can activate different mechanoreceptors to make people feel a pinch or um, a stroke 
or to feed, to simulate weight of a bag on your on your uh, the pressure of a bag on your shoulder. Until today, most of devices have been have been um, targeting the mechanoreceptors that can feel frequency vibrations, and that's what your most of your devices have. Think of your smartwatch or your smartphone or any, uh, even if you have an alarm, they use vibration first because vibration is very perceivable. Like you can, um, if it's against a hard uh, um, surface, it's also noisy. And because it's cheap, creating these vibration motors is cheap. But why are we interested in all other kind of receptors? If we have these vibration motors, we have been using them in our devices for a long time, they've been achieving their, their goal. So I could tell, for example, if I get two, two vibrations, it's a message. If I get one, it's a call. If I get three, for example, it's, um, let's say it's an important email. The problem is you have to cognitively understand and remember the different patterns that each, um, the, different, the different vibration patterns and the meaning of them. And you can remember a few of these patterns, but you cannot remember all. That's one problem. Also, vibration motors can be intrusive. As I said, if you have your device on a hard surface, it will make noise. So, so far, vibration motors have not been the silent, friendly notification, really. And they are not super localized. So maybe you create, you want to put a, a, a vibration motor on this location of your body. According to research, you can only make difference between one vibration motor and another if they are three centimeters apart which means that the resolution of information on your skin is very limited. So imagine you can have on your um, forearm probably a three by three, a matrix of three by three, which limits the um, shapes, for example, that you can create. If you want to create a circle, you will have to go pixel kind of wise in vibration, in, in activating the vibration instead of the continuous movement of um, a curved circle. Uh, circle. So what makes um, all other types of um, touch gestures interesting is that they simulate our relationship with interactions with other humans. They also give us this dexterity that allow us to feel objects and understand what they are and learn um, how to use tools. And they also make us aware of our surroundings. A vibration motor can tell you, can maybe push you in one way to, to make you look at somewhere but all your mechanoreceptors working together, they can tell you about the entire environment of around. What is surrounding you? What, what are the movements that are happening? So the question I pose is why don't we have these, why, why don't we have these kind of touch gestures in our um, smartphones and smart devices? Why do, why do we only have vibration motors that activate the receptors of the frequency? Do you have an idea? Why can't we generate a touch or a pinch or a stroke using our um, electronics right now? Is what is cheap? The vibration motor, yes, it's cheap, but it's not expressive, right? That's, that's the issue. It's not expressive enough to, for you to take it to a virtual reality experience and feel all, all the things that are happening to you because it's just going to vibrate everywhere, everywhere on your body. So vibration motors are cheap, that's good, but they are not expressive. If I want more expressive gestures, I need more motors. I need different motors. So the, the, the simple answer is the hardware of these motors that can make movement and forces is bulky, expensive, and also, in many times, it's mechanically noisy. So this is how a vibration motor looks like. It's very. This is one one an 18 millimeter uh, vibration motor. It's very small. You can see how much it's embedded into a smart watch. All it does is that it moves in a certain frequency and it pushes your skin slightly. Your skin detects that it knows something is happening. What's happening is not clear, but it knows that you ha there is an alert. If I want to create motions that simulate touch gestures, 
then I need to go bigger. I need to use servo motors or, um, uh, for example, other um, electromechanical motors including pumps um, and um, voice coils. And these are a bit bigger because they have something called, um, uh, 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 sorry, a mechanical, mechanical um, extension. So what that mechanical extension does is that your motor actually does a very small movement. It does this, for example, very small movement. To augment it, you attach an arm to it, and then you attach a gear in order to make this uh, augmentation happen in another location, and then you attach a belt in order to make that, that, that um, for example, arm move. So all these mechanical connections make the device or the motor eventually bigger. In this, in this research paper that is um, by um, Stanley et al., what they did is they tried to make all these touch gestures using these typical motors. So here they have the tapper, this device taps, and this is how it, um, it, look, it looks in a 3D rendering. So you can see here there, there's this arm, the ar there, there's motor in, encapsulated here, and the motor just makes the arm raise and go up and down on the skin, creating a tap. The dragger, similarly, there's an arm, but this, um, there's a continuous movement that makes the arm, this arm move over the surface. This is a squeezer. This belt um, becomes uh, tighter. Um, so the motor actually pulls, pulls this belt from here, makes it, making it tighter so you can feel a squeeze. And finally, this is the twister. And this is just another um, simple mechanism that uses the belt and moves it into um, uh, in a torque kind of way in order to create a twist-like sensation. This paper was a great proof of concept that it is possible, it is interesting, and they proved experimentally and empirically in a user study that is actually more expressive than vibration motors. With these kind of gestures, you can tell direction, you can tell magnitude, you can tell progression. But the hardware is not optimal. And this is where we come with our, our, our um, springlets. The idea is to mimic all these gestures using one type, one single type of motor, which, which, which is the shaping alloy, in a very thin and soft structure. What we were able to achieve or provide exam examples of is six, um, six different types of springlets. And we have provided um, a complete pipeline to teach you how to fabricate them in the lab. So they're really um, super inexpensive. They're easy to fabricate. You need only 15 minutes and $6 and you're good to go. And then we will, I will show you applications of them that are not possible with regular vibration motors and are really um, not um, effective or efficient with basic motors. So this is the first springlet. This is a pincher. And the pincher actually feels like someone is pulling on two points on, on, your, on your skin. It's super simple, but it simulates it. And I want you to recognize that each of these springlets does only one thing right now. So they are, their, their job is to do one atomic movement. This is our directional stretcher. So it pulls on the skin on one direction over the other. You could imagine that this can be used to tell someone to um, look in one direction or another or to notify about uh, movement. This is our presser. It pushes on your skin diff given, uh, with different forces. This is our puller. It is actually the inverse of our presser. We took the presser and we flipped it and we connected um, part of this um, green element to the skin so every time it bends, it pulls part of the skin with it, so it's a floor. It's not, it's, the feeling is very uncomfortable because it's different than your expectation of a pull because it's a one point pull. We're not expecting that. But um, yeah, it does a trick. And finally, um, we have two types of um, springlets that um, use objects to, um, uh, um, on the skin as well. This is our expander. The idea is that you put an object that can become larger and the SMA just makes it larger or smaller by activation. And finally, this is our dragger, 
which can move an object on the surface of the skin. Okay, so this is how a shape mirror alloy looks like. As you can see, it can be very thin and it's very flexible or malleable. We can get this in smaller dimensions, but every time we go smaller, the effect or mechanical work becomes less. So this can generate around 30 grams of force. Imagine an egg falling on you. That's how much it will weight. That's what the 30 gram looks, feels like. Um, if I go thinner, um, I will have to um, work with 20 grams and 10 grams. If I go larger, I can reach up to um, 250 grams and even more um, if I do custom manufacturing. So 250 gram is the biggest you can get on the market, but you can do larger with custom requests. This is a simple um, show of how they work. So I only pass current through them and they change um, from one shape to another. So the shapes that they were trained to do is an extended spring and a compressed spring. If you go to the internet and Google shape mirror alloys, you could see that people were more creative and they, were, um, they could do shapes that transition, for example, from a flower shape into a, a, a rope shape or from any, any shape that you can imagine, a 3D form into a 2D form. However, to do this, you, requires, you require a very high temperature. So every time you want to train an alloy, you get a, a wire alloy, a specific one that's called um, a shape mirror alloy. Ours is made from nitinol um, wires. And then you make it into a certain shape and you put it in an oven. And the oven makes it remember the shape. Once you remove it from the oven and you add current to it, it will transition from one shape to another. So the shape that it was before the heating and the shape that happened during the heating. And these are the two shapes that are used in springs. So what makes springs um, interesting for our application is that because of this coiling, they, they allow the, um, the transition to be larger. So we were, we were able to take a shape mirror like that is 10 centimeters and make it compress into five centimeters. If I took it in a wire form, which is thinner and more interesting maybe, it can only um, it, uh, contract to 8% of its length. So the coiling gives um, advantage for displacements. On this, on this kind of um, uh, plot, you can see where shape mirror alloys, um, how they compare to other motors. So we have here basic DC motors that rotate, pneumatic motors that are um, that kind of give you um, pressure on fluids or um, air. We have AC motors and um, sorry hydraulic mo motors are for um, uh, liquid pressures. And what this graph shows you is how much the device weights versus how much force it generates. And SMAs, SMAs are where they're very, very small in, in, in weight compared to all others but have relatively higher power. So their ratio eventually is the highest among all of these. So they are the smallest motor that can generate the highest um, ratio of, um, of work or force. So as I said, this, uh, this idea that we came up with is just an improvement on proof of concept systems that I've already explored touch gestures on the skin. We talked about Stanley's work, this is Lee's work. Oops. This is Lee's work. Um, this is even more bulky. This is a, a complete system that just rubs on the top of your um, knuckle. Um, and what they want you to show is that rubbing, for example, is more expressive sometimes to um, tell you a pleasant message than vibrating. Um, this is a device that um, drags an object on your skin so it can actually draw small shapes like a circle or a rectangle and make it continuous um, drawing. They use two motors to achieve that. These are um, basic uh, rotatory motors and they have br uh, foam brushes on their top. So every time they rotate, the brushes move um, in the direction of rotation. And they showed in an application that these can be used for um, blind users or p people um, who have um, who cannot focus um, on the road in order to give them navigation directions.
people who have used smart shaped neural alloys have used them for haptic devices, but in super limited ways. So most of the ways that have been used are to create pressure. Imagine that you have the spring that I showed you wrapped on your arm. If it, goes, it becomes smaller, it gives you a squeeze or a, a kind of press um, effect. And what we, um, what we show is that they can be more creatively used to create different um, output. So now I will talk quickly about the design factors, fabrication, and evaluation parts. Let's see, just, can someone give, tell me the time? Okay, um, and wrap up with the um, evaluation because I think this is what um, is interesting for this course in particular. So the design factors are how we were able to design our springlets, and we considered a few factors. First, how they're attached on the skin. So they can be directly attached on the skin, like in our pincher, and when they're attached on the skin, they will actuate the skin. That's simple. The second type of um, actuation uh, or attachment technique is by connecting one end, at least, of the shape of the shape mirror to an object that can change shape or location on the skin. And then you can imagine that the object can be very rough, so it can create a rough texture on your skin, or it can um, make it rotate, so you could feel the edges of the object on your skin, or it can expand, so it could, you could feel more pressure on your skin. The second factor that we considered is bias force. So if you remember, the stretcher was able to, pre to stretch one point on the skin more than the other. And how we do that is, that is that we change the bias force, the force that resists the movement of the shape mirror alloy. By, by making this end larger and this end narrower, the shape mirror alloy will say, well, there is less work to do here. I'm going to move at this point, and I'm not going to move at this point. And this is how you make it do directional movement instead of the usual centric movement, which is go from two sides to the, to the center. We also found that we can add bias forces either by using springs. Um, at the end of the SMA, springs can be of different um, um, resistance, so they can force the SMA to move in one direction more than the other, or by adding objects that can bend, bend and flex. So once the SMA contracts in this example, it will force that object that is attached to it, this green object, to bend. But once we remove the current, the, the SMA will relax, and the object will flip back to its straight um, status, creating um, this pressure effect. As I mentioned, we could also use um, an extra, extra spring, and this is what we're using in um, this example. So there's a spring embedded in this um, zigzag shape, and it is the, sh the, the, um, the bias force that is responsible for stretching the SMA back once the current is removed, because the SMA can do work only in one direction. Put current, it contracts quickly. Remove current, it relaxes very slowly. So you do need some kind of other, um, biasing power, uh, power to get it back to its position. We also explored using two SMAs in front of each other. So one pulls and one pushes. And this way, we can have more control over the speed of actuation. Another, the third design factor is the angle. So this is basic um, physics. If you put something on an angle, the force vector that it will um, create depends on that the, the angle's steepness. So in this case, because there is an angle between the shape mirror alloy and the object, the, the, the force vector is generated will, on one hand, press the object to the skin, towards the skin, and also try to drag the objects toward one point. With this kind of um, arrangement, we guarantee that the object stays in contact with the skin. This is easy if we're thinking the skin is like this, but if, you're, if, if the object is here and the skin um, is vertical, then the object will tend to fall. But with this mechanism, every time we actuate the SMA, it will push it towards the skin and then drag it. So we can create, uh, we can guarantee contact. Finally, the final um, design factor is the shape mirror alloys themselves. As I said, they come in different dimensions. We should consider two, uh, two factors in dimension. Assuming they, they are made of the same material from the same manufacturer, 
you have two options. One, how many um, coils do you get, so the length? And two, how much is the radius of the coil? If you go deeper, you will also consider the thickness of the wire that is made, that the coil is made of. But usually um, in, in, um, uh, on the market, this is not an option for um, consumers. Okay, so if I get more coils, what do I get? What, what, is, what do I get from my actuator? More what? Displacement, more movement. Because the displacement is a percentage of the length. It's always 50% in our case. So if I get it 10 meters, it will move um, uh, any object that is attached to it five meters. If I put it five meters, it will move any object attached to it only two and a half meters, right? So length corresponds to distance and um, displacement. Width, or let's say that the diameter of the coil itself is correlated with force. If it's thin, small force. If it's large, higher force. Okay, so given what we know about the SMAs and how they, they move and how they can be attached, we went on to fabricate our structure, which is how to put them, to put all this together in a small structure that can be worn on the body and do the work. So this is the skin. You start with one layer from silicon rubber. This layer is used to hide the SMA inside, and it's necessary because SMAs are fragile, so if you actually bump into them, you might stretch them and they will not go back to their um, original shape anymore. So there is a, a limit how much they can be stretched before contracted. But if you stretch them more, they're like, oh, I, forgot, I forgot the shape, so I can't go back to it anymore. So we always have to encapsulate them. Also, SMAs generate up to 70 degrees of heat when they are contracted. And that's a lot of heat on the skin. So we have to definitely make sure it is, they're protected from the above and below. The second layer is our tactile. This is a tactile layer, layer. This is the interesting layer. Based on the shape, the size, and the opening that we're making, we determine how the SMA will produce force and where it will be distributed on the skin. If one end of this layer is larger, you're creating a directional stretcher. If this area is narrower, you're creating, you, you will allow an object to move in this, air, in this area, for example. Um, if this whole thing is smaller, it's a smaller um, displacement. The third layer is our attachment layer, or and, that, and the layer that closes the system together. And um, for that, we use kinesio tape. So we figured out it is, we either use kinesio tape and a heat barrier in order to prevent the heat from getting to the skin, or if we use double layers of kinesio tape, that also works very well. And kinesio tape is super breathable, so even if you sweat under this system, the, syst the, the device will still be connected to your skin, so it will not kind of um, fall, fall apart, and SMAs are not affected by liquids, so they will contract as they should. This is how much we achieved in thinness. This is a three millimeter thin structure, um, given that it has a coil that generates um, 30 grams of force. So we could um, use small coils, achieve a little bit more um, thinner structure, and this is how much they can bend, so they're highly flexible. This is a small video showing you very, very quickly how to create your own springlet. This is silicon rubber. Silicon rubber um, can withstand heats up to 300 degrees sometimes. It is the same material that is used in your baking forms, like the cupcake forms that are flexible. So it's skin safe and super flexible and heat resistant. We um, embed the shape mirror alloys in this um, tactile layer and then we cover it with um, another layer of silicon just for protection. So it's quite a simple um, process. The materials are really limited and they're inexpensive. So um, we have covered at least a few criteria already um, in our, in our um, requirements. So how did we evaluate the system? We chose only three springlets, one that creates um, Tangential tensile force, like stretch or pinch, one that creates the um, normal force. In this in this case, we used um, our presser, and one that creates um, tangential force that moves something on the skin surface. 
We put them on six locations on the body and we chose the locations that have not been explored very much, especially near the head um, and um, the ear because one of the um, benefits of SMAs is that they are noise free. So they contract smoothly. They don't contract in discrete movements like uh, usual motors and they do not make any um, electrical or mechanical noise. We also asked users to wear them and um, try to, under to detect if they can feel them while they're moving and while they're sitting down. So in terms of noticeability, the question was how, how much can you notice that on, the, on a liquor scale, liquor scale from one to five? And you could see that the presser was the least noticeable, even though everything was above three. The least noticeable um, pincher and dragger were almost similar. And it seems like the wrist was our no, less noticeable area. For expressiveness, we did not tell the users what device they were wearing, and we asked them to figure out what they were wearing. And this is just a heat map showing um, for different body locations how much they were able to detect. So the pincher was always high, presser and dragger were um, um, less than distinguishable from each other. There are several reasons. Um, one of the main reasons is um, the dragger, when placed on a hairy body, it actually kind of gets, the object gets stuck in the hair, um, especially on the chest or um, on the arm. And it, 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 it feels like a presser because it gets stuck there and the SMA keeps trying to pull the, the object to move, but instead it's actually pulling on the hair. Um, so we, we figured a few problems with, um, with skin contact. We're trying to fix them, but for now, this is um, uh, what we got in terms of expressiveness. Finally, um, we wanted to understand how wearable they are as in how comfortable they are, and we got really good um, ratings on that. One user said, I forgot that it was already in my back, so they actually tried to lift the, us the leave user to study with the SFA on, or the springless on their back. Um, one girl said that it feels like, just like a necklace that is laying on my chest. This is when it was on the chest area. Um, and one user said that, said that actually they're aesthetically pleasing. So that was an, an aspect that we didn't consider, but why not? Okay, so application-wise, we were thinking to use these as intimate messengers. So this is for so mediated social communication where touch gestures actually mean something. You're connecting with your parents, with your partner, with your kid, and you want to, to give them this small tug on their ear just to tell them how much you miss them or how much you, you remember them. This is um, one application for that. This is a mindful application, which actually relies on slowness in order to tell you to breathe in and to breathe out give, um, in um, over eight seconds period. So to achieve that, we controlled current, we reduced it, and this is how we make the, the SMA contract slower or faster. Um, our navigator was um, a bunch of, SMA, of springless put together easily, just stick them together, and this way how you can create a spatial interface that maps um, identically to the um, environment. Our virtual reality backpack is made of three pressers. It kind of simulates the tug of a bag on your shoulder. So every time you get a point in a game, it gives you this first. First, it gives you this tug. And then all of them, they try to mimic the weight of the bag. OK, so this wraps my talk. And um, this wraps my evaluation of how sh uh, smart materials um, in general shape mirror alloys in particular can be used to create new soft interactive these glasses. Do you have questions for me? Okay, so um, if you have questions in the future or you are interested in using these materials, please contact me or Adrian. He is my co-author on this paper and he um, will be here longer than I am. Um, so it's nice meeting you all and have a pleasant day. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.